so uh, this is our final lecture in a very long lecture series. And uh, I, I uh, said to you last week, you know, congratulations, you've just taken a college level course uh, at a semester long, uh, not exactly at the point in your life where many people take college courses. And I do think, frankly, uh, you've received the kind of introduction to inequality studies that uh, a, a, a very good university level course would give you. I, I, I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope that you come out of it with a better understanding, not only of the nature of the inequality in our society today, but the forces driving it. And now I want to concentrate on the final element of what to do about it. So, so that's where we are. Uh, and uh, let me um, get the lecture shared with you uh, and uh, get it to the right place. Um, so, as I say, today is our, our final lecture on this topic. And uh, I, I'm going to refer to the end of inequality. What could we do to end the new gilded age, the tremendous levels of inequality that have uh, been present in our society for at least the last quarter century, grew the quarter century before that, put to an end what's sometimes called the Great Compression, the period in the middle of the 20th century where inequality was much less pronounced in the United States as well as much of the developed world. And today we're going to focus on ambitious proposals. And, and so I'll, I'll uh, give you a little review of what we covered last week, this week and last week. We've really been concentrating on the policy proposals for reducing inequality. Um, and last week, uh, we looked at what I call stage one reforms, sometimes the low hanging fruit, the stuff that we could do, I believe, here and now. And I, I am well aware that the uh, talks on uh, another round of pandemic relief, another round of economic stimulus have completely broken down and it does not appear that they will be resumed until September. President Trump has uh, promised to do some unilateral uh, uh, executive orders to, to try to replace what he and Congress have been unable to hash out. Uh, we'll have to wait and see, but it's quite clear that there's much that cannot be done by the president alone. It's not clear frankly, whether he can do much of anything. Uh, but certainly it will not replace what congressional action could accomplish. And, and, and so in light of that, uh, you might say, well, can we do anything right now? And, and I do think there's a sense in which probably over the next two and a half months, as we uh, make our way into the thick of a presidential election, we should not expect much to happen. But over the next six months, I'm much less pessimistic. And, and what I said to you last week is, is that I believe that there are a number of what would seem to be extremely ambitious efforts at ameliorating or reducing or correcting for inequality that might be passed as immediate responses to the coronavirus, right? And, 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 and so the, the current crisis we're in is severe, deep, profound enough that it might just break the logjam in the federal government around certain issues like job creation or affordable housing, since these are areas where the coronavirus is really uh, endangering large numbers of people, not in terms of the actual disease, but in terms of its economic effects causing massive job loss and massive housing insecurity. And, and so in addition to that, and I'll review this a little further in a moment, 
I also suggested that there were some issues that could be pursued without requiring any federal government action. And that in a sense, the, we, we, we need to be careful of the trap of thinking we can't get federal legislation done, we can't get anything done. And, and I do think that one of the things we are increasingly appreciating is that the 18th century constitution our founders bequeathed us has many elements that are worth defending, celebrating, maintaining. But it also has some elements that really are not working in a 21st century political and social context. And that makes it very difficult to legislate at the federal level. And until we can perhaps repair some of what's wrong in our federal government, we may need to look elsewhere to, to get things done. Look at the state level, look at the local level, look at the non-governmental level. And I suggested at least one major proposal in, in that regard as well, which I'll get to in a moment. Then for this week's class, what I wanna concentrate on is what I'm gonna call stage two reform. So stage one reforms, that's the stuff that might be done easily, uh, either because the coronavirus breaks the logjam or because we can bypass the federal government altogether. Stage two, these are the real moonshots, as they say in public policy, right? Referring, of course, to uh, President Kennedy and the idea that we would put a man on the moon within a decade. Uh, that was an incredibly ambitious goal. It's a goal we met. And maybe we need some incredibly ambitious goals with inequality reduction as well. And then if time permits, I'm not confident that it will, I'll talk with you a little bit about what's happening in national politics, which is where I'll be pivoting to next week. All right, so just to then uh, refresh your memory on the details of, of, of what we talked about um, last week, uh, I suggested that we need a comprehensive suite of equality promoting policy reforms implemented in two broad stages. This is just reviewing stage one. Uh, and, and I suggested that right now we, we need systematic support for job creation. You may have seen uh, the job numbers came back a little bit better this week. But when I say a little bit better, they're still unprecedented when it comes to any previous recession. They're just not as bad as things were from March to July. And, 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 and so don't get me wrong, I don't think that the most recent job numbers are necessarily an indication that the economy is starting to pull out of this. I think it's an indication, probably a, a, a lagging indication, that the economy has opened up a little bit more. Uh, and I worry, frankly, that the result of the economy opening up is the spread of the virus, which may result in the economy contracting again. But all that to say, without getting lost in the details, we are in the grips of a historic economic contraction with tens of millions of Americans having been thrown out of work. We now have lost the supplemental unemployment insurance, which was making that economically tolerable for many people, we should expect more and more people to be economically desperate and that the clamor for job creation will grow. And let us hope that then intelligent, long-sighted policy will be adopted. Similarly, when it comes to the housing crisis in the United States. Many states uh, have now extended uh, eviction moratoria, but we can certainly expect that this will not go on forever. And that once the moratoriums are lifted, we will see uh, a, a, an absolute uh, torrent of eviction proceedings and many 
hundreds of thousands of people facing imminent homelessness. And these are not just individuals, these are families. These are families with children. America already had an eviction crisis and it's going to be amplified exponentially by what's occurred in the wake of the coronavirus. And, and so we need to, to do something there. And I, I hope again, that the coronavirus will, will generate in the attending economic crisis, almost irresistible um, economic and political demands to do something about housing. Something similar could be said about healthcare. That's probably the heaviest list, lift on my low, uh, hanging fruit uh, example, uh, examples of low hanging fruit. Uh, I'll, I'll point out to you when I get down to the last two measures, we're talking about things that do not require governmental action, that each and every one of us can ask is this thing that I am thinking about doing for my children, my grandchildren, my great grandchildren, my nieces, my nephews equality promoting or is it opportunity hoarding and and if you look at yourself in the mirror and you say eh, i love my grandchildren but i have to admit this is something that i'm trying to do to advantage them that many less advantaged children have absolutely no opportunity to do i'm not saying don't do it but do it in a way that also creates opportunities for other less advantaged children. And tell your children, your grandchildren, your great grandchildren that you're doing this and this is why you're doing this. And, and in a sense, instill in them some sense of both the importance of equality of opportunity and also of the relatively privileged position that they may be in, so as to generate in them a little critical distance from the way in which inequality has grown in the United States. And so many of us take it for granted, as well as perhaps a lifelong commitment to not being opportunity hoarders themselves. And I also pointed to college admissions reform. And I'm not going to go through all of this again, but I pointed out to you that there's very good social scientific research that essentially suggests that uh, college admissions officers, again, if they take that test, they look themselves in the mirror, they recognize what they're doing. They are admitting students on the basis of qualifications that are much more difficult, if not impossible to attain for the worse off in our society. And in fact, they know if, if, if they just do the reading that there are markets that sell these opportunities and they are expensive whether we're talking about early childhood training, whether we're talking about chess lessons, violin lessons, karate, soccer, uh, tutors, test prep training, right? It amounts to a huge expenditure. And so de facto, what we're doing in the college admissions process is rewarding these people who spend seven, $8,000 a year per child over that entire 15 year period and punishing those people who simply can't afford to pay that much. And that the result is that even the best test takers among the people who are in the bottom 25% of income do worse than the worst test takers among the top 25% in terms of college admissions. There's something completely broken about this outcome, right? Where wealth matters more than academic qualification for admissions 
to college. That, that's what this diagram, I believe, really says. And we see this in looking at the way in which uh, the Ivy Plus colleges, the most elite colleges, look at that. From the top 20%, they get more than two thirds of their students, right? From the bottom 40%, they get less than 10% of their students. Again, that just says to me that college admissions is broken. It needs to be fixed. I didn't show you this last week. This is another way of looking at this. If you look at the top 1%, they are going to private nonprofit schools and public schools, right? And, and going to NYU and USC and Notre Dame and Cornell, uh, they're, they're uh, going to Michigan and Wisconsin. I'm, I'm a little surprised not to see UC Berkeley on there. I'm not sure what's going on. You then look at the bottom 20% and the single largest category for them is that they're not attending college whatsoever. Right, so, so this is another way of saying there's something deeply amiss in college admissions in the United States and the colleges themselves can fix this. We don't need governmental action. We need a change in policy that says we're not going to require our less advantaged and privileged students to directly compete with our most advantaged and privileged students. We are going to adjust our expectations on those who cannot afford to invest in the way that the hyper wealthy can. We don't want to be 60% from the top 20%. We want to roughly mirror the composition of American society. And, and so that's an example of, of this kind of reform. And I will just point out to you, if we were to do this, what we see essentially is that poor children at elite colleges do very well economically, almost as well. So right, this is, this is the bottom 10% in terms of income. Look, they're doing almost as well as the people who come from the top 90%. Similarly, if they go to other elite colleges, even if they go to select public colleges, it raises their income substantially. Whereas if you don't look at those kids, what you see is a very steep curve of inequality between children from the bottom 10% to the middle 50% to the top 90%. And this is something that colleges and universities should not tolerate, given that they have the power to counteract. All right, so, so that's reviewing the argument I, I made with you last week, making sure we, we're all on the same page. Um, I'm just gonna look for a moment. I'm not seeing any questions. Let me pause, hit your space bar if you've got a question. All right, then I'm gonna push into the next stage here. And, and, and this is the moonshots. This is the stuff that it's in fact um, going to be hard to accomplish. It's going to be hard to accomplish because we've got one major party that is clearly dug in in opposing these kinds of reforms. We have concentrated wealth in our society that is used to fund campaigns, not only that, but to lobby and to fund research that opposes these kinds of measures and then creates an intellectual climate where there's skepticism about these kinds of measures. Uh, so this, this is not going to be easy. Nevertheless, I believe it is absolutely essential. And, and as you can see, there is um, a, a long list here. And I, I'm not going to be able to go into the details on every measure. I don't think you would necessarily be interested in all the details, but I do want to uh, talk a little bit about each of these measures and then to drill down on, in particular, tax reform. 
Now, uh, let, let me say a few things uh, about tax reform at, at the outset. One of them is that we're not talking about one kind of policy per se. We're not only talking about federal income tax. As you will see, uh, among the things I'm, I'm thinking that, that we need might be a value added tax. That's essentially a national sales tax. That's a regressive tax, right? To be clear, it is a, a, a tax that falls more heavily on the poor than the rich because the poor purchase more as a portion of their overall income than the rich do. The rich tend to accumulate their wealth. The poor tend to spend their income because they don't have enough to accumulate. And as they spend, if we have a nationwide sales tax, say 3%, um, then that falls more heavily on those who have less income. Now, let, let me say why I favor this. And, and, and I'll go back then for a minute to the kinds of reforms I, I think are possibly attainable in the present moment. Job creation, affordable housing, healthcare reform. Now, those are expensive. The, these are not low hanging fruit in terms of being easily affordable. As a matter of fact, these are extremely expensive. We're talking about trillions of dollars. And what the relevance of that is, is, is that in order to fund those programs, I, I, I do not believe we should avoid deficit spending. Quite the contrary, I remain a Keynesian, someone who believes that in the midst of an economic contraction, it makes a great deal of sense for governments to spend a lot and tax as little as possible because that's what stimulates the economy and gets it going again. I also believe that some kind of job creation program like a Green New Deal, some kind of affordable housing infrastructure plan that gets us not only greater housing in the cities that are the hubs of wealth creation in the United States, but better transportation in the surrounding periphery of those cities um, and healthcare reform would ultimately create much more wealth than they cost. They would be measures that stimulated long-term economic activity. Obviously, job creation does that fairly directly, but allowing people to afford to live where the jobs are increases economic mobility, access to good wages, and the labor supply in America's hubs of economic productivity. And the current healthcare system is an incredible drag on economic productivity in this country. We're spending more than twice as much of our GDP on healthcare as most other developed societies are. And the largest portion of that comes from private employers who could be using those resources to pay their employees more to invest more in research and development and facilities and technology, right? And, 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 and so all of those measures would perhaps ultimately pay for themselves. But it's also the case that we will require increased tax revenue to fund them. And one really good way to get income tax revenue is value added tax. And so to be clear, if we have a regressive national sales tax, the only justification for it in the circumstances of extreme inequality that we find ourselves in the United States today would be if the revenue generated from that regressive tax 
were used in a very progressive way to fund jobs that benefit the least well off, to fund housing that benefit the working class and the middle class, to fund forms of healthcare reform that benefit everyone, but especially workers in the gig economy and in other forms of precarious employment where they don't currently have health insurance. So that's a, a first tax reform measure. A second tax reform measure is uh, referred to as a Tubin tax. Uh, and, and the basic idea here is a global wealth tax transfer. And, and I'll say not a lot about this, but I will tell you that, that one of the problems that we face right now, and I, I believe I, I said that incorrectly, what I meant to say is a global transfer tax. And, and, and what that means is if wealth is transferred by an individual or a corporation from one country to another country, it is taxed as a result of being transferred. And what this does, among other things, is it disincentivizes hyper-wealthy individuals and large corporations from attempting to escape the domestic tax by transferring its wealth someplace else, finding a so-called offshore wealth tax haven, right? And, and, and we see this with Apple and other large corporations transferring a significant portion of their operations to Ireland because Ireland is, is a very wealthy, I'm sorry, a very low tax uh, country or wealthy individuals transferring their wealth to the Caribbean, various places uh, in the Caribbean that are tax havens. And, and, and so the Tubin tax tries to prevent people from uh, paying no cost for trying to shift their resources merely to avoid taxes. Third idea, and, and I'll talk more about this in a minute, I'll just mention it now, wealth tax. And, and, and so the, the first uh, three ideas are really new forms of taxation, which would generate new revenues uh, that would allow us to fund more progressive initiatives in the United States they would also attack tax dodging and uh, hyper concentration of wealth. So a wealth tax taxes the very wealthy, people who say have more than a billion dollars in wealth each year on their wealth. And, and, and the issue that we get into here is that many of the hyper wealthy uh, do not have income that is very high. They structure their income and their wealth so that they don't get a lot of income, so that they don't have to pay a lot of taxes, right? And so you can have, as Warren Buffett often remarks, tens of billions of dollars and still pay less in tax than your secretary pays. Um, as a result of the way in which you structure your wealth and your income, right? And he doesn't mean, I think, less as, as a, uh, an absolute number, but less as a proportion of his income than his secretary is paying. And uh, in addition to that, it's just the case. And, and I'll get into this a little bit more in a few minutes. Um, but that um, if you don't attack hyper-concentrated wealth directly, it will continue to accumulate and become all the more concentrated. So as opposed to merely taxing income, the idea here is to also directly tax wealth. It could be a quite modest tax, 1% or 2% on only the wealthiest individuals, individuals who make, who have, I'm sorry, a billion or more dollars in wealth. And, and you'll note that, that Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren endorsed this idea. It's getting increased attention. I'll tell you a little bit more about where it comes from in a few minutes. Uh, many European countries had wealth tax 20 years ago. There were some problems in administering them. 
fewer countries have those taxes now, but there is, uh, I think, some important literature coming out of uh, academic economics that suggests that there are ways of administering the wealth tax that avoids the difficulties the Europeans encountered. And, and to be clear, the, the aim of a wealth tax is not only to generate revenue, it is to break up large concentrations of wealth as being inherently unjust and anti-democratic. We'll get a little bit more into that in a few minutes. Uh, restoring the progressivity of uh, federal income and corporate taxation. Again, I'll, I'll, I'll say more about this, but one of the things that's happened in the last 50 years is that we've gone from having in this country one of the most progressive to having essentially a flat tax on income, right? That means that the very rich and the very poor are paying basically the same. As a matter of fact, the very rich are paying a little bit less than working class Americans when it comes to income tax. And there's just something obviously unfair about that, and we need to restore progressivity to our income taxes. Again, uh, I'll drill down on this in a little bit. Final thing to, to, to think about here is eliminating pro-rich tax subsidies. And so give you uh, two examples, the home mortgage interest deduction. I imagine many of you owned homes and benefited from this. And um, there is a warrant for this. There's a rationale behind it, at least when it was passed, which was that it would encourage home ownership. But um, the fact of the matter is that very few among the bottom 50% of American society have been able to attain home ownership. And so the result is either that the way in which home ownership is financed needs to be fixed to make it available to the bottom 50%, or else we need to recognize that as it functions right now, home mortgage income interest deduction is subsidizing the wealth accumulation of the top 50% of our society. And that is inherently regressive, right? We're giving a big tax break to people who have assets that are worth between 500,000 and a million dollars, right? That's, that's the value of the home where people find it most beneficial to take that deduction on their taxes. And many people are saving tens of thousands of dollars in taxes a year as a result. And that means that the federal government has tens of thousands of dollars per relatively well-off individual less to assist those who are less well off. And, and so again, a, a strongly regressive tax, as is the 529 college savings plan. And I don't know, I imagine many of you do not know about these plans. Uh, they're, they're for people who don't yet have children who are college age, right? But it essentially allows you to save tax-free and then to spend tax-free. Again, I think there's a good idea here, which is to encourage people to save for college. But again, if we look at who takes advantage of it, it's almost exclusively the top 20% of our society. And so uh, 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 those are the people for whom uh, it makes sense in terms of a tax savings. It's also those are the people who tend to have the resources and to get the advice to use these plans. So another highly regressive uh, aspect of our tax code seems to me it, at this point, these need to be eliminated. All right, second uh, big moonshot idea, something that will take a long time that we'll have to build political will, political knowledge before we attempt to enact this. But please note the remarkable gains that Black Lives Matter has made in the last few months since the killing of George Floyd. And, and I'll point out to you that 
uh, before the killing of, of, of George Floyd, uh, fewer than 30% of Americans supported Black Lives Matter, the movement. Uh, that, that is a, a label for a movement for criminal justice reform, especially police reform. And it's come to be something of an umbrella for more general efforts at racial justice in the United States. And again, I, I, I can't go into all the details here, uh, but I would point out to you that uh, the black white wealth gap remains stubbornly between seven and 10 to one. What that means is that the average white family has between seven and 10 times the wealth of the average black family in the United States. And I will not try to make the argument to you today, but I believe there's an extremely convincing, robust body of social scientific research that suggests that really the only reason there is a persistent gap in wealth the only reason that the assets of white Americans are seven to 10 times as high as the assets of black Americans is because of the history of slavery, subordination, exploitation, and racism. And so as a matter of justice, our society owes a debt, but also as a matter of democracy, if we really want to be in a, uh, in a society where blacks and whites are equal citizens, we also need to be in a society where there's not obvious racial stratification, where it's not clear when you look at the average white person that they're bound to be much wealthier than the average black person. And that is the society we're in right now. And again, it's going to be difficult to do this. I don't think we can do this without a fair bit of universal wealth equalizing legislation. But we also have to recognize that those universal policies will not by themselves eliminate the black white wealth gap, that we will need racially targeted policies to try to foster not just wealth creation, but the accumulation of the human capital, education, professional training, networks, and the resources necessary to create business or to invest in yourself that would be necessary for a genuine and robust African-American middle class to emerge in our society that was comparable in size to the white middle class that we're trying to bolster with this kind of legislation. And by the way, uh, we will also have to pay attention to other dimensions of racial inequality, but the most glaring and most obviously unjust dimension of racial inequality is the black white racial wealth gap. Um, third, extremely ambitious idea that again, I think we need to have on our 21st century political agenda if we are serious about um, addressing our inequality is some form, and I'm sorry for the jargon, of decommodified social income. What does that mean? That means that there's some guarantee that you will have minimum economic security even if you are not able to get a good job. And, and that's a radical change. And, and I, I, it's a change again that, that certain societies are already exper experimenting with, provinces in Canada, Finland as well, increasingly uh, other places in Europe are moving to the idea of, of what's sometimes called universal basic income. The idea is that in the 21st century with technology and globalization and automation, we just don't have enough good jobs for everyone. And we can 
try to tackle this one of two ways. The first is to try to create enough good jobs for everyone. And, and I do believe we should be doing our best to foster as many good middle class, middle income jobs as possible. But that if the economy simply doesn't support them, it may be in fact more economically efficient and more beneficial for the long-term health of our economy to allow basic income grants. And, and you may have seen some of the Democratic presidential candidates were in fact in favor of this idea. Um, and it would need a lot of work to, to be hammered out the details of it. But the basic um, insight here, and, and there's a influential economic work that, that was published earlier this year uh, called An Economy Without Jobs. And, and, and it doesn't really mean that there aren't jobs in the 21st century economy and the new emerging information technology knowledge economy, but that there aren't enough good jobs for everyone who is motivated to get one to have one. And we can be doing things to increase the number of good jobs, but we may not be able to do enough. And if there is not going to be enough, then we need to allow people a basic, decent form of economic security. Genuine, fair equality of opportunity is my next big idea. Um, and I'll, I'll just point out, this is a knowledge economy. US is, is, is alone, the United States is alone in the developed world in having incredibly disparate levels of funding for schools, locality by locality. And the single largest determinant of housing value in the United States today is not the square footage of the house. That's what it used to be. It's the school district that the house is in. Even a small home in a good school district is worth more than a large home in a bad school district, right? And, and, and so what we're seeing is that people are voting with their feet. They recognize that they need uh, a, a, to, to, to get their kids to better schools and paying if they can, this goes back to, to that opportunity market in the first stage of it, paying to get access to that better school. The, again, this is on its face unfair, right? It shouldn't be the case that the child only has the opportunity that the parent's income can afford. The whole idea of a public education system is that we make a collective a commitment to equalize education for the next generation. We are completely failing to do that. And the single most important thing we could do would be either to equalize access to schools, to essentially break down the barriers of school districts and allow kids to move across district lines or to create much larger districts that incorporate poor and rich areas and allow the kids from the poor areas to attend the schools in the rich areas or else to equalize funding for schools in the United States. Next idea, I pointed out to you months ago that one of the major factors leading to the growing inequality in the United States is the decline of union membership. And again, um, this is not something that has happened uh, as a result of impersonal laws of economics. This is something that has happened because of public policy, because of changes in the law and changes in the enforcement of the law. And we need to return to laws that encourage at the national level, the formation of unions, make it easier for unions to be formed and workers to join unions and make it more advantageous to belong to a union uh, in terms of the way in which collective bargaining and wage negotiations go, right? And, and, and so in a sense, this is going 
back to the past, right? J just restoring legislation that we've already had. Um, it almost certainly needs to be combined with then a, a, a suite of legislation because I don't think by themselves unions will be able to restore greater wage equality. So we need to change corporate governance. And, and the way to do this, it seems to me, again, is the way that Germany and Austria and other societies in their corporate law have done it, which is to say that the governing boards, the board of directors of corporations need to be more diverse in their composition. They need to include not only shareholders, but stakeholders, where the stakeholders are understood to include, in the first instance, the employees of the corporation, and second of all, the consumers of the goods that the corporation produces. And that if you were to have roughly equal representation of shareholders, employers, and, I'm sorry, employees and consumers on corporate boards, you can bet that uh, CEO compensation, but also wage levels would change dramatically. And what we see in those societies that have this alternative kind of corporate law is that there's a much fairer distribution of income and wealth at the level of the corporation. Uh, justice and compensation, that the wage that you receive should by law be a wage that's sufficient to live on. Um, and this means in practice, increasing the minimum wage, which, which has fallen dramatically as a result of inflation, failed for over a decade to keep uh, up with the rate of inflation in the United States. And at the same time, the cost of living in many American cities has gone up astronomically. The cost of healthcare, the cost of education have also gone up dramatically. And, and so we need to have legislation that pegs our wages to the actual cost of living in the areas we live. Um, so, um, uh, the, the, the next uh, idea on my uh, laundry list of moonshots here is uh, to have meaningful campaign finance and lobbying reform. And, and I won't say too much about this, but one of the things that we recognize in light of everything we've studied together is that uh, concentrated wealth tends to turn into concentrated political power. And one way to address that is to try to break up the concentration of wealth. And we should definitely do that. Another way to address it is to try to prevent the channels of influence from being too easily penetrated by the wealthy, right? And some campaign finance reform may require a very different Supreme Court and a very different kind of jurisprudence. I, I, I think that there is widespread support for this. Um, I anticipate that if there is a, another president, a different president a few months from now, uh, it may be the case that slowly the composition of the federal judiciary will change. But note that that, that will be a long, difficult process. It may take a generation um, to, to, to really remake the federal judiciary so that it's more progressive, more amenable to these kinds of reforms. And so in the short term, uh, we should be looking at measures that don't require major changes in constitutional law. And I believe there are a, a, a large number of measures. Again, I won't get into the detail, but a, a, if we're serious about uh, returning to a more equal society, we also need to be looking into the ways in which the very wealthy are able to tr uh, transform their economic power into political power. Aggressive enforcement of antitrust legislation and beefed up banking regulations such as the Volcker rule that, that demands uh, strong separation 
between the portion of the banking resources that come from ordinary deposits and those that are used for investment. Um, and, and again, part of what's generated the, the extreme concentration of wealth in our society has been the concentration of ownership, uh, especially in the information sector where Google and Microsoft and Facebook and Apple are essentially buying all of their competitors before they can become genuine competitors, right? And, 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 and so, classic predatory monopolistic behavior. We used to have legislation in place that could be used to counter that. Uh, today that legislation has drifted away from the forms of concentration that we need to be concerned with and so we need to uh, update antitrust legislation for the 21st century. The last thing I'm, I'm going to mention here um, is trade agreements and an overall trade regime. And on the one hand, uh, I think that it's absolutely clear that globalization is here to stay. And, and that in a sense, all of us, not just Americans, but especially Chinese, and Indians, the poorest people in the world, have truly benefited from globalization. And that if we're concerned with equality, we can't only be concerned with domestic equality. We need to be cosmopolitan as well. But we can't think that it's a sufficient compensation for the former unionized industrial worker who's lost his job, his economic security, his social standing to say, well, but things are better in China and India as a result, right? That, that's not the kind of compensation we need. Uh, we need to be able to enter a globalized economy without sacrificing the economic security and standing of our middle class and our working class. And, and so, on the one hand, we, we need all of this to do that. And on the other hand, we need trade agreements that not only allow for a much more integrated economy, but also are equality promoting and include uh, what are called social tariffs, right? And, and, and so if you don't have unionization, if you don't have decent working conditions, if there's evidence that you have slavery or sweatshops in your economy, or if you don't have good environmental regulations in place, we are going to impose tariffs on your goods, not to prevent trade, but to force you to have a decent economy. And of course, we need to be thinking about China and India and Brazil and Mexico. In, in, in these regards, as well as other places in the world, and, and to make it fair, the, the, the competition between the United States, where we do have unions, if not as much as we should, where we do have labor standards, even if they're not uniformly enforced, where we had and, and presumably will have, again, good environmental regulations, we should not be unilaterally disarming in a global economic competition by doing the decent thing domestically. All right, so I know I've, I've, I've talked for a long time. Let me stop there and, and open this up for questions and comments. So I'm about to unmute everyone. Uh, I would appreciate it if you have any background noise. Uh, the, the best thing to do would be to quiet it. Alternatively, you can remute yourself if, you, if you've got something in the background that's going to make noise. Here we go. Here we go. How, how, do, I, how, do, how do I do this now? Can uh, you hear me? I can hear you. Who is that? Lois. Hi, Lois. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, I, I love all of this, and I'm thinking to myself, I mean, we all love all of this, we can't address all of this. Uh, it's too much, uh, as 
someone interested in promoting these objectives, where do you start and put your energy to accomplish something, forgetting that there's all of this? Well, and, and, and I did say, right, I, I, I've got a laundry list. I've, I've got a kitchen sink of proposals. And I, I did put them in something like the order that, that I think we should pursue them in. Uh, and, and so to be clear, right, we, we've got these two lists. And, and let me go back to the, the shorter list of the more, I think, attainable reforms. I think we absolutely ha have to concentrate on job creation, affordable housing, and healthcare reform. Those are the, the big three that we have to do right now. And then when it comes to the next list, I believe that the single most important thing to do is tax reform. Uh, I, I didn't share this with you, but let me spend a moment on this. These are the kinds of works I would be drawing on to talk with you about tax reform. But what you can see, right, th this is, um, let me see if I can get rid of my image because it's in the way. This is the, the tax levels in 1950, in 2018, and in 1978. So, so essentially taking uh, three snapshots, this is the amount being paid by the bottom 10%, the amount being paid by the very top. And what you can see is that in 1950, we had a very progressive tax system, right? Where the people at the bottom did not pay very much and the people at the top paid a lot. And that today in 2018, taxes have actually gone up on those at the bottom. Uh, gone up by a little bit relative to 1950 and those in the middle and gone down on those at the top. This is the opposite of, of, of what we should expect. And so very quickly uh, to restore progressivity in our taxes, we could gain more in terms of overall revenues and get a more equal society by reducing taxes on everyone but the top one, I'm sorry, 0.1%. No, I'm sorry, top 1%. So, so we, we reduce taxes somewhat on, on the groups at the bottom, somewhat in the groups in the middle to, to restore them to where they were in 1950 and then on the top 1%, especially the top 0.01% increase income tax. That both breaks up wealth and provides revenue for some of what we need to do. So I would suggest you're absolutely right that, that there are too many items on that list to, to get it all done at once, Lois. They're all moonshots and you only do one moonshot at a time. I would suggest that tax reform is the most important of those moonshot ideas. Do you want to follow up on that, Lois, or does that help? No, no, that's fine. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Anybody else with the question? I'm, I'm looking at the, at the uh, atrium. Just to, I, I, I don't know where Lois was. She wasn't in the atrium, right? I was. I was oh, you I was. are. Okay. Okay. Oh, now I see you. Now I see you. Okay. Does anybody else have, have a, a question for me today? What are, what are the chances of getting this tax reform? What are the chances? Um, not good in, 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 in the next year or two, right? Uh, I, I'll be direct, I'll be honest with you. The, the scenario in, in, in which we get them uh, would be a scenario in which um, obviously, we have a new president. And, and, and by the way, one of the main things the tax reform would have to do would be to undo the tax reforms of 2017. If, if you look back at that diagram, uh, the reason that 2018 is the line that they use for comparison, because that's the first year with the post-2017 tax reform tax rates. Uh, and, and that made our tax code much more regressive, right? That's what Donald Trump 
and <coughs> a Republican Congress did when they had the power to change the tax code. They made it even more regressive. So we would need a new president and the Democrats to have sufficient control over Congress to get major legislation passed. And then we would need the political support for this such that they would be willing to take the risk to do it. Um, I think there's a very long shot scenario in which we actually have that next year. But I, I, I think it's a very long shot. And, and so really what we need is another election cycle or two before you have the numbers in Congress, if you do have a Democratic president, to get this done. But I'll point out to you that, that the history of the last 50 years is very clear. Republican presidents make our taxes more regressive. They pass reforms that benefit the wealthy. And, th and they do this as a matter of principle, right? It, 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 they don't disavow the idea. They say taxes on the wealthy depress economic growth overall. That if you allow the wealthy to create wealth, that trickles down to the rest of society. And Democrats, consistently pass progressive taxation. And they do not believe in the trickle-down theory, and they do not believe that um, regressive taxes benefit overall economic growth, and especially that they benefit those who are less down, uh, who are further down the economic scale. And they believe that uh, the requirement of distributive justice is that tax policy benefit those who are least well off. And, and, and so there's a, a, a possibility that the Democrats would have enough power to do this next year. Uh, we'll have to wait and see. But I, I, I do think this is a heavy lift. It's why it's on my moonshot um, uh, list, not on my low hanging fruit list. And please recognize that, that the moonshot took uh, basically a decade to accomplish. Major policy transformations do not occur right away. Anyone else with a question for today? Yes, I have a question. Please, who is this? It's Ann Friedman. I'm in my oh, apartment. Hi, I would like to know what are the chances of our viewing the tax return of the president? <laughs> I guess that depends on whether or not you are the local prosecutor in uh, New York. <laughs> <laughs> who, who has a subpoena that's likely to be enforced, uh, then, then I think your chances are very good. If, if you're not <laughs> Cyrus Vance Jr., then I think your chances are pretty slim. Uh, I, I suspect eventually we may know this. Uh, some of this has been divulged, as it turns out, by Donald Trump's niece, uh, who gave uh, some documentation to the New York Times. Uh, but no, I don't, I don't think we're going to see Donald Trump's tax returns uh, between now and November. I don't think there's any chance of that. Uh, and I, I doubt that we will see them at any time soon. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I'm very well, dissatisfied. I know. It, it, it's, it's a norm. It's not a law. Now, now you may know that, that California has passed a, a, a law saying that a presidential candidate has to uh, divulge their tax returns uh, to participate in their primary. So it may be in the future that we will actually be able to see uh, all presidential candidates' tax returns, but that's not the case yet. Okay. <laughs> all right, everybody, any other? Uh, questions? Yeah, Go ahead. Nobody else, because this is my second question, but the, um, t the, the tax deduction on home, for homeowners yes. um, has helped to build a middle class and to help people uh, get into homes. Uh, to eliminate it uh, is hurt, to me, hurtful for people's ability to be able to have a home. And while it may have some positive aspects to it, I really feel it's the wrong thing to do. 
thank you for that comment. And um, I'll just point out to you that you, I, I don't disagree with you in the American context. Uh, and, and, and so in this country, the mortgage interest deduction has made it economically viable. And I'm gonna say, frankly, for the middle to the upper middle class to own homes, but it has really done nothing to benefit the lower middle class, the working class. And so I'll just point out to you, this is not the only tool in our policy toolkit. Uh, the Netherlands basically gives everyone who is gainfully employed a state grant to assist in purchasing a home. By the way, they then give them grants, I think every five years, or, or low interest loans every five years to assist in maintaining their homes, right? And the result is that whereas in the United States, very few people in the bottom half of our income distribution own homes, in the Netherlands, almost everybody owns a home, right? At least everybody who wants to, right? And, and, and so I'm, I'm not saying get rid of the mortgage income deduction and I'm sorry, mortgage interest deduction and put nothing in its place. I'm saying put something better in its place, something that helps middle class people, upper middle class people, but also lower middle class and working class people to acquire homes. And, and, and so don't just eliminate it and then there's nothing, but put something better, more equitable in its place. Can I say something? Do you hear yes, me? Yes, please. Uh, Marjorie, go ahead. You have said everything right now is based on who comes in in the election. Because if the Republicans come back in, none of this can go through. Is there anything we can do right now in in, other than trying to ensure the Democrats are brought into power <laughs> beyond the government? Is there anything we as individuals are, are, are we cannot in our age group do very much? But our children, children's children, certainly can, possibly. What? Let, let me show you something for a moment. And, and this will be the last thing I, I show you today. Um, actually, here, let, let me show you this way. Uh, are you seeing that? No, that's not a very yeah. good way to see it. Um, hold on for a second. Um, oh, come on. Um, so I, I, I'm having trouble uh, getting you what I want you to see. I'm just going to do it this way. I, I, I hope you're, you're seeing now a diagram about the states. It looks kind of like a, a, a snake, right? And I, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I know it's not very easy to see, but this is a diagram of, of why it is that Joe Biden is currently favored to win the election. And what this shows you is state by state, right? Uh, that, that Biden has more than enough states to win the electoral college vote right now. And that's because he's ahead and, and in these very light blue states, right? Wisconsin, Minnesota, Pennsylvania, Florida, Arizona. And by the way, at points he's ahead in North Carolina, Ohio, Georgia, right? Here, here's what I want to say to you. Um, what we could do from the comfort of our own rooms is to phone bank, right? We can, if, if we're interested in the outcome of this election, we can call up our local Democratic Party office and say, you know, I'm, I'm not in a position to go knock doors. I don't live in a state that I think there's any chance that Donald Trump would win, but yeah, can you give me a list of phone numbers I can dial uh, in Georgia, in North Carolina, in Ohio, in Michigan, in Wisconsin, in Pennsylvania, and, mm -hmm. and maybe I'll spend an hour a day trying to encourage people in those states to get their ballot early, to turn it in early, right? I mean, I, I do think that there's a lot that's got to be done because in holding an election during a pandemic, there are a whole bunch of obstacles 
to people yeah. being able to, to get their vote registered. Uh, and so I do think that, that there are things you could be doing uh, from the comfort and safety of your own room. And by the way, of course, you could be encouraging your younger relatives to do stuff too, and especially to get to those states where it matters most. All right, everybody. Lovely as always getting to talk with you, and I will see you next week. Please continue to be smart and safe and take care of yourselves. Have some fun as well. See you next week. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Take care.